Hello everyone, and welcome back to this next video in the eHoudini Academy Foundation module. In this video, we are going to get started on the second part of our modeling chapter for the balconies. Now these are a bit more complex than the elevators or the staircases that we worked on previously. Uh, in fact, they require us to make adjustments in at least two different parts of our network that we already built. That is for the wall tiles and for the assignment for where the balcony should go. But next to that, we also need to actually create the code that builds the balconies themselves. So we'll build this up in steps, and this will probably take us a couple of videos. But after that, we'll be done with the building component of the tool. And the only thing that will be left at that stage is to optimize our tool so it runs faster and is more responsive. But OK, for now, we are going to work on the balconies. Now let's have a look at what this means. Over here, I have my balconies tab in my tool, and it allows me to control where the balconies are placed, such as, for example, at which floor they start, which is something that we already have, right? Then we can also control if we want to spawn balconies at all. So if I turn it off, then we'll basically have the building as we had it before. And we can control in what way we spawn our balconies, such as by range, which is similar to how we made the doors work on the bottom floor. But in this case, it actually loops around for each layer of our building. And because we're using by range, that means that they actually get offset, which results in this interesting pattern right there. But maybe we want to ensure that our balconies are always in a certain location. So we'll also have the pattern method available as well right here. And with that, we can specify which tiles, which tile numbers, right, we want to have a balcony assigned to. So we can control this very precisely. Moving down, we also have the ability to control where doors should go. Now, the way how this is set up is that balconies will always try to spawn with a door. As long as a door is able to be placed, that is. So we identify which points of our balconies have valid locations where a door can go and then it will pick the one most suited to our settings over here. Now, if we want to make sure that we only have doors in very specific locations, once again, we can also use by pattern. However, in that case, it might mean that we won't have a door at all. So in this case, there is no door. But if I were to specify, say, tile 56 over here, then now we will have a door at that location and only at that location. Well, that and tile zero, which is over here. But in this case, this is actually a corner, which is not allowed to have a door. So in that case, we won't have a door, right? It needs to be allowed. And if it's not, then it won't spawn one. So if I want to have a tile here, I would have to say, say, segment two. And then it will work. So there's a bit of uh, code involved just to make sure that this all works. By default, I will leave this to by range. And at that stage, every balcony should spawn with at least one door. If you want more of those, then you can always uh, decrease the interval to say every two tiles, at which point we'll have a lot of doors. Now, next to that, we also have the ability to control our balconies themselves. So over here, we have the balcony. We can control how deep it is. Let's say change its depth to three meters, which makes quite a deep balcony. And the way how we're going to set up our code is that they can wrap around corners. Now, this isn't completely infallible. If you were to set this too far, it might start to fail. So if I push this up to six, I can't guarantee that it works. Yeah, here you can see it starts to break. But basically, as long as the balconies aren't too deep, it's fine. It, this will function and it will wrap around the turns like so. We can also control the thickness of our balcony railings and next to that we can control their height. So right now they're 1.1 high, which seems to be about right for the player. So if I grab my player character and I just walk onto our balcony here, this seems about fine to me. It's about player height, right? But we can control that as well. So all of this is going to be built in these next few videos. And uh, with that, let's have a look at the code in Houdini. So if we look at the example file, what we're going to do 
is we have to add a couple of new sections. Like I mentioned, first, we're going to have to build a system that assigns on our points a series of groups. Before, we did the same thing for our doors at the bottom. So if I look for the door groups down there, you can see the lighting up. Now we're going to have to do the same thing for our balconies, for both the balcony themselves, the yellow points, and then the balcony doors. And that's what this system deals with. The system up here assigns the balconies, and then down here, this part assigns where the doors should go. So they should always be in a valid um, space. Then down here, we have our tile loop once again. Now parts of this is going to be part of the compiling system, which we'll deal with after this chapter as the last part of the foundation module. However, the parts that we're going to add consist mostly out of the ability to add doors to our upper windows and balconies as well. So we're mainly going to add these components. And then finally, after that, we are going to have our tiles with a new element, in this case, a balcony, let's say, proto plane. Okay, this is the basic shape of our balcony. And these come with a couple of groups and attributes that we can then use. Moving down the list, we can split those out and then use them to construct our balconies, extend them around corners, and then finally extrude them and give them a texture. So with that, uh, I think we've covered everything about the balconies and I think it's time we get started. So let's move over to our main project file and let's have a look where to begin. Okay, so the first thing that we should work on is over here, where we have our group assignment currently for the doors. So if you might recall, looking back a couple of episodes, we created this system where we had our spawn points and the spawn points have groups. So if we look under the point groups, then right now we have a group for our bottom floors, we have a group for our doors, and we have one for the ground floor itself. So that's the bottommost floor, right? Now we need to add a couple of extra groups here for our balconies and our balcony doors as well. Luckily, we already have the code that we need and we just need to inject it over here. Plus, we can also identify our group patterns from here on the left for the uh, pattern selection and promote it up to the interface with pretty much the same settings. So let's do that first. I'm going to go and grab my entire network down here, including this part. So let's hold shift and let's just drag this all down. Okay, so then next what I would like to do is copy this network up here the section that creates the groups for our doors at the bottom of our floors. Now, I'm going to copy this, I'm going to rename the nodes, and then I'm going to also rename all the variables inside. So instead of using a doors group, we are going to use a balconies group. But next to that, I also need to update the interface as well, because I need to hook this up to a new interface element. Right now, our doors are hooked up to these settings over here. I need to create new unique ones for the balconies. So before I start doing all of that, let me first update my interface so I have what I need before I continue. Let's go to our type properties. Let's go in here. And then let's look for the balcony section, which should be a small section over here because we haven't added too much in there just yet. So I'm going to temporarily close these other networks except for our doors and windows folder. So in here, let's just copy all of these parameters and I'm going to paste them into my balcony section. So I'm going to put them first into the node just by pasting, but then I'm going to reposition them in between our balconies start at floors and railing height. So um, first we have our balcony start at floor variable. Then we have our new parameters and then below we have our railing height. Then let's go ahead and grab a couple of separators, plug those in. So we um, have this as a separate segment right in our interface. And then let's change these names around. So first 
I'm going to change all of these to balcony instead of door. But I'm going to leave all the settings the same. Then next, let's go to our door count value. And let's change that one to balcony count. But for the label, I'm going to name this one balcony width. And the reason that I'm changing it to balcony width and not balcony count is because in this case, it reflects better what it's supposed to do. If I look at the example file, then the balcony width value basically describes from the start point on our balconies, how many tiles the balcony actually has. And then depending on the interval, they're either going to be connected to the next balcony set over, or they're going to be separated. So in this case, this would be a balcony size or width of six. So let's go over to the um, channel. I'm going to set this to a value of five by default. Then moving on, let's go to the interval section. Um, and I'm going to change this one again to balcony interval. And down here too. Make sure that the height when flag refers to this parameter. So for the rest, um, we still have a couple of other ones. This is the balcony offset. And then let's do this one too. Okay, so with that, we've now adjusted all of these variables. Um, we now have our balcony pattern, which is all set up. We have the offset, interval, width, and then the mode. Okay. Then next, um, we'll also need to duplicate this one for the doors as well. But we'll do that later when we start building that section. For now, let's apply this and let's look at the interface. So over here, we now have our controls, which means we have a range or a pattern, and we have our width value right there. So if that works for you, then let's move on. Okay, so I'm gonna put this one down here for a bit, so it's out of the way, but I can easily grab it. And then next, let's go and copy these nodes. So next, let's grab this network and let's copy it down. So let's make a copy. And I also would like to make a copy of this um, group node here. Let's plug that down here. Then let's hook everything up. So this one goes there. This one goes there. We need to make sure this is plugged into the group node above. So we have a link like that. And then the output goes into our last node down there. So if you have this set up, you basically have a duplicate of that network, but we do need to um, reattach everything to make sure this works properly. So let's go over here to the left and let's start making some changes. Now this one is going to be called group balcony pattern. So I'm going to change the note name. And as for the name of this group, let's call it balconies like so. Then let's change the actual expression in here as well. For that, we need to go down to our patterns. And then here we have our balcony pattern, right? So either grab it and drag it in or go over here, type balcony pattern, and then it should be in here as a string field. So if you have that set up, then now we can actually specify it. So let's look at that group. We have it down there as a pattern zero for point zero. Let's say we want to grab this up to 10. So that's working. If we change our balcony pattern, our group also changes. Then next, let's move down the list. So here we have our transfer doors from nearest point. 
Let's change this one to transfer balconies from nearest point. And then for that up here, we need to change our doors group to balconies. So it should be in the list. You can simply grab it from here and that should work. Then down below, we have this group combine node. Now this group combine node does need to be changed. If we look at the result on how this is working and I clean my view a little, then you can see here that up top, we have our intersect with ground floors node. And all this one is doing is it's taking the doors groups that we already have throughout the entire building, right? All these yellow points for the doors. And then it makes sure we only keep the ones on the bottom layer of our building, the bottom floor, which intersects the ground floor group. So that's what's happening here. We take our doors group that becomes equal to our doors group. So we just assign that one as our first group to work with. And then we intersect with our ground floor. Anywhere that happens, we keep the group. Otherwise, we throw it away. Now, what we need to do now, in this case, is instead remove anything um, with the bottom floors group. So let's change it over. First, we need to specify the balconies group instead which will be here, balconies. Let's remove doors. And then let's change it over to instead of intersecting with the ground floor, we are going to subtract, like I mentioned, with the bottom floors. And delete that and set it to bottom floors. And what this will now do is it will ensure that we won't have any um, balconies spawning in the bottom floors section of our building. So that's this part of the building, right? The gray section where we don't want balconies, where we have different types of windows, but we do want them up here. Okay, with that set up, let's move over to the right. So here we have our doors group by range. I'm going to change this one to um, balconies group by range. Let's change the name of the group. Again, double check your names. And then down here, we have the parameters on where these are being spawned. Let's set it up to be the balcony count. And in this case, balcony count, which is down here under by range in our balconies folder, is named balcony width. So don't worry about that because we kept the um, name intact as balcony count. We only changed the label. Now, just to make sure that you don't run into a problem here, double check your parameter name and make sure it's written correctly there. Okay. Then let's do the other ones too. This is going to be balcony interval and balcony offset. All right. So let's double check our assignment. You can see that at the moment it's appearing on the bottom of our building. Uh, we'll deal with this in a minute because that deals with the actual range in which this group can actually exist. Right now it can only exist on the bottom 51 points of our building, which is exactly our bottom floor. But first down here we have these parameters. If we change these, then you should see changes here and there as well. So we have our interval, which determines how much distance there should be between each balcony start point and we have the offset so we can move them around on the bottom of our building. Okay. So as for the starting point and the end point, I'm going to change this over. So instead of using the start and end, which is basically the entire range of point numbers, I'm going to use the relative start to end. And if you do that, then now it's going to treat the entire point set as a selection, but then we're going to remove a certain amount of points at the beginning and the end. So if I set this one to 51, we won't have points on the bottom floor or maybe 52 actually. And as you can see, we also have almost no points on the top floor because we are removing equally a certain amount of points from the bottom and the top of our point range. Let's change this over 
So the end becomes zero. Let's copy this expression for isolate walls here. Make sure it's copied and then press delete, type zero. And then you can remove the expression flag on this uh, parameter here. Change it back to a default HScript parameter by right clicking and saying delete channel. If you do that, the value should stay there, but at least we won't have that uh, expression flag anymore. It's not a big issue if you have a static value in a parameter marked as an expression field, but I just want to clean it up. So that's how you do that. And then under start, let's plug it in, what we just copied. So nprims for isolate walls. This one grabs a parameter from up top, specifically up here, where we have the number of primitives, right? The exact amount of entries for tiles for one layer. And then I'm going to multiply that by the amount of floors that we don't want balconies to be at. So that's actually here. Balconies start at floor. Let's copy that parameter and let's multiply it with that. As a result now, we won't have any balconies on the bottom floors. Pretty neat. Let's move on. So here we have our door mode switch. Let's change it over to balcony mode. That should now be hooked up. And let's rename it. And down here, we have this one, the attribute create for our tile ID. Now, as you might recall, our tile ID is actually an attribute on our tiles. And we're using that to assign a different tile down here in our network. If I look at the end result of this setup, and I just make sure I hide all of this stuff, then here I have a color node. So at the moment, our bottom floor doors are red. Our bottom floor windows are white. That's value one. And then value zero is the upper floor windows. What I would like to do is add an additional value over here in this attribute create node for the balconies. So let's change this one to balconies in here for our balconies group. Make sure you plug that in properly. Uh, I want to set my value to tree. And when we do that, you won't see any difference because tree is a higher value than two. And inside of this network, we have a switch with only three inputs. And the last input is for doors. So if we force this node to try and grab an entry that doesn't exist after the last entry, it will always grab the last entry. Okay, that's how a switch works. Let's grab a new null node, plug it in here, and I'm going to rename this one to balconies or let's say um, window upper floor with balconies. Now at the moment we have nothing because basically we just uh, fed it an empty node. We can plug it in over here where we have our window upper floor. So at least we have something. But they will be colored red at the moment. And that's because of course we don't have a color representing value tree. Let's change this over so we have a unique color for our balconies as well. I'm going to set it from 0 to 3. And then our colors, I'm going to drag this over a bit. Something like that. And let's create a unique color for our balconies up here. Maybe, um, let's see, maybe yellow. Yeah, yellow works pretty well. So that will work. We now have a unique color and we can see where our balconies are. But before I continue building out the door system for the balconies, let's go ahead and actually set up a basic system down here so we can see our balconies visually as a mesh as well. And for that, we need to add a new component to our loop over here that will hook into our window upper floor with balconies node. Let's go ahead and create a new grid right there. Let's expand this a bit. 
In fact, if you still have this poly extrude node, um, feel free to get rid of it. And I'm simply going to add a grid. Let's put it over here on the left, separate it from the rest. And let's call this one balcony floor. All right, so let's hook this one up. Let's say we grab our bottom nodes down here and move them down just a bit, create a bit of space. Then let's grab a merge node, grab this one over here, pull it to the left, and let's put a merge node above that. So as a result, we now have something we can plug our balcony floors into. In fact, let's put it up here for now. And let's plug this one in. So that one goes in there. Let's call this one um, Merge Balconies. So now if we look at this result, you can see that we do have our original window tile for the upper floors, but it now also comes with this grid. Let's change the grid around. So first, we only need two rows and two columns. So we just have a simple primitive. And then as for its size, I want to use the width value that we're already feeding to our um, tile frame up here, because we don't need this to be any wider. Let's grab this expression from our tile frame, and let's plug it in to our size in X. Now we do need to hook that up with a spare input or it will error out. So let's grab a spare input. And I want to grab, of course, my tile data over there. So that will give us this. And then next, let's reposition this grid so it sits in front of our window on the outside. So that in this case is the brick side, not the plaster side. That means we need to move it forward in the Z direction by its own size, right? Over here under center, center Z, let's type channel reference size Y and then multiply that by 0 0.5. If we do that, the entire thing gets moved forward and that should sit just right at the front of our tile. Then as for its depth, I actually want to create a parameter to control that because this is too tall. If I change this, maybe something like 2 meters, 2.5 is more in the range that I want. So let's go over to our um, type properties and down below under balconies, let's add in a new parameter here, a new float. So I'm going to grab a float value, plug it in. And this float value is going to be called balcony depth. Now for its range, I'm going to limit it to have a minimum depth of one because having a balcony that's smaller than one meter can't even be traversed by the player. In fact, if our balcony um, railings are too deep, we won't even be able to walk there. So let's set it to at least one. And then the maximum range, I'll set to three. I'm not going to lock it, but it shouldn't really go above that. And then under channels, the default value is two. So if we have that set up, we can apply that. And we can now pull that parameter out. So let's grab it, let's say balcony depth, plug it in here. And now we have controllable depth for our balconies. All right, very nice. So with this, if we now look at our final result, we should now have balconies being assigned on our upper floors and we can control this through our interface right so we can say by pattern like so and we can say between 0 and 10 and then maybe 20 and 30 and this will spawn them straight up like that or alternatively we can use by range now like I mentioned by range uses the actual range on our building and it also uses the seam. So if we look at the final result, 
what is it looking like right now anyway um, and let's say we visualize the seam then our seam is right there and you can see that's where our balconies actually stop spawning depending on your interval and the amount of um, tiles in each floor of your building it's gonna look different okay in some cases you'll have this stepping pattern um, where it almost looks like it's diagonally going up the building in other cases it's going to be a repeating pattern that's just how the um, interval operates we have 52 tiles at the moment and divided by 8 will result in a repeating pattern now all that aside um, at this point we basically have our basic balcony system set up now I'm not actually going to build the balconies just yet we'll do that in a later video but for now what I need to do is a sign where the doors should go because having balconies means nothing if we can't get onto them right so for that we need to add a new section up here specifically for that now the core system of our assignment component is actually the same system that we built up here we'll have two methods to assign where the door should go again a system based on range so group by range and a system based on our pattern so in fact we just want to make a copy of this network once more but we need to make a few more adjustments to it to make it work properly so one more time let's make sure I have enough space let's grab my entire network hold shift select everything and then I'm just gonna drag it down a bit more then let's um, copy our group balcony pattern node paste it down plug it in and let's also copy these nodes so let's copy this network paste it down below let's plug this back in as we did before but this time I am gonna make a couple of changes so this will be our groups for balcony doors network And I noticed I didn't rename this one, so this should be balcony groups. And then as for this network, so this one here, um, again, requires us to create a pattern and it also requires us to create a range control setup. So again, let's open up our type properties, go down to our balconies folder or minimize everything you don't need, right? Let's copy some of these. Now, in this case, we want to grab the balcony mode, balcony interval, offset, pattern, and then the separator below, but not the balcony width. Because if you think about it, uh, we don't actually need to have, well, multiple doors in a row on our balconies. I mean, you could, you could technically do it for the bottom floors, right? But I imagine that you won't have multiple doors right next to each other in a row on a balcony it doesn't make as much sense so i'm going to leave that one alone let's copy these ones and paste them back in below make sure you um, have them as value 2 not the originals so in this case i'm going to change this one to balcony door mode like so This is going to be balcony door interval. Balcony door offset. And balcony door pattern. Now down here, we still need to change our height when flags. So let's also do that. Make sure that all of these are set up with balcony door mode. In this case, the interval and the offset should have is not zero. And then the pattern should have is not one. Now as for the values on these, um let's double check them in this case balcony door interval 
I'm going to set that one to seven. Balcony door offset, in this case, I'm gonna leave it at zero. And the pattern is also gonna stay at zero. So with that, we now have these set up. Let's apply this. And this should now have given us the controls for our balcony doors, so we can configure those. Let's go ahead and hook these up as well. Under our balcony group node again, let's rename this one again. This is gonna be balcony door pattern. And for the group, it's going to be balcony door. Not balconies, but balcony door. As for the group um, expression, let's plug this one in. So this is gonna be balcony door pattern, like that. So now if you set this to pattern, we should be able to control this as well. Okay, so that's working. We now have the ability to assign points like that. And as you might notice, we now have a new group called balcony door up here. So that's good. Let's uh, set these one over as well. This is gonna be transfer balcony door group from nearest point. So in this case, this should become balcony door group. And then next, let's have a look at the um, group combine node over here. Now, previously, we used this one to make sure that we only had balconies on the top floors. In this case, what I want to do is make sure we only have balcony doors on the balconies. So it shouldn't be here. It should be down below our switch because we need to apply this to both of these nodes. Let's copy this node or drag it off and plug it in down here. I'm going to um, rename this one to only allow on balconies. Now the group that we want to set in this case again is the balcony door. Copy that. Let's replace balconies with that. And then I'm going to say intersecting with balconies. So it should only allow it that if it exists. But you'll notice that right now we're actually getting an error and that's because we don't have our balcony door group existing just yet. That's because this is a group combine node and a group combine node that can't find a group will error out. So let's go up top where we have our dummy node. And up here, I would like to quickly add two new dummy groups for our balconies and our balcony door group. So let's add this one. Um, that should be group balconies with a semicolon and then group balcony door and then also with a semicolon. So with that we now have a dummy group present on this node, which um, should make sure that we don't have a crash if the group is missing. So let's go ahead and make this node red because uh, it does remove a part of our group. And then below this attribute create node, let's change it over so it creates a balcony door attribute. So we have the group and likewise we have the attribute, right? In this case, I wanna set it to a value of one. So that way we will actually have a balcony door attribute right here if our group is present. Now at the moment, we don't actually have a group yet and that's because we haven't finished setting up these two nodes. So let's do that quickly. This is our balcony door mode switch. like that. So now we can flip our balcony door mode from there. And this part here, this um, balconies group by range node is going to be used. However, we need to move it outside of this network. And instead we are going to inject it into this line. So let me quickly show you what I mean. Let me grab my example file again. And here we have our spawn points for the balconies. 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to isolate all of our balconies. So we only have those points. And if you might recall, these points have an ID. This is called the um, segment number, right? Now we can use that to um, basically connect up these points together based on which is the next and the previous number. We can do that with a simple wrangle node, this script here. And we'll write this in this video. Now this might look a little complicated, but we are going to do this step by step to make sure that uh, you understand what we're doing here. We are going to use quite a bit of VEX in this video and in the next when we actually deal with the creation of the balconies down here. But for now, let's look at this part. So this loop, in this case, processes each floor. So if I isolate one floor, say this one, you can see we have all these balconies and right now they are being connected with a polyline. And I'm doing that using this wrangle node here. So the wrangle node samples the current point number, the current uh, segment number, right? This attribute. It finds if there is a point existing behind it. And if there is, it connects with it. Now we also need to make sure that we can identify points that are, um, let's say on the seam. So point zero, because there is no point negative one. So we also need to connect it up to the last point if that one exists the last point on a floor, right? In this case, point 54. So that's um, what we're going to write here. Now, these points are going to describe where our doors are going to be on our building. So let me quickly grab those again. Let's say we look at it this way. Now, if we don't want doors on the corners of our building, then we can remove them here. And that means that it will no longer try to spawn them where there are corners. So these two and this one won't try to spawn a door. And then next we are going to take every one of these connected balcony segments here, loop over each one of those. It doesn't matter if we loop over them as points or as primitives. In the end, all I really care about in this case is the points. And then we can identify inside of that a point that we want to have our balcony door on. So in this case, we are using a group by range node, but we only place one door every so many intervals. Uh, we can offset the position of that door. So if we look at our point numbers, not our segment numbers, so let's hide these for a minute. Then this group by range node is basically going to loop from the start to the end and then back to the start again. So we can control how many points we want this to be apart. Let's say I visualize my balcony doors group. And then over here under my balcony doors interval, I can move this to a lower number at which point we can say every two points, every three points, etc. Um, or we can offset it. So I can offset it back. And depending on our interval, um, we'll have one door or multiple. So it actually loops back over itself, which should effectively ensure if we enable everything again, that every balcony spawns with a door, no matter how many potential door locations that balcony has. The only case they won't spawn with the range system is if there's simply no place for a door to spawn, like say the corner of a building. So at the end, um, that's what we're going to do. Let's go back and let's start building that. So the first thing to do is uh, expand this and let's create a extra dot up here. So we can pull some data from this. I'm going to pull that off and plug it into a blast node. Let's drag it over to the right. And I'm going to call this blast node the isolate balconies. So make sure you select your balconies group and then say delete non selected. 
and that should give you all of your balcony points right there. Then um, next, let's loop over them so that we can connect them up together and we can identify which balconies are actually supposed to be considered for a door. Let's create it for each loop by point. And in this case, this loop is going to run over the floor attribute. So let's just type that in um, floor. Make sure we can identify what the group is doing. Under piece attribute, let's specify the floor attribute. And if we test that out, then now we should have that. Yes, okay. Let's expand this a bit. And then inside, I'm first going to sort all my points um, based on the segment ID. So let's look at one loop here. Let's say loop number three, maybe. Let's grab a sort node. And just in case these points were messed around somehow, I'm going to sort them, point sort, by attribute. And then I'm going to say the segment attribute. So with that, at the very least, I know for certain these points are ordered properly, because that's important here. Let's call this one by segment ID. And the next, let's write the VEX code that's going to connect these points up and create some new polylines. For that, let's create an attribute wrangle. Let's plug that in. And let's rename this one to connect continuous um, balconies. This is going to be quite an important node for this to work. So let's do this step by step. We don't need to import too many parameters here, but I'm just going to keep this one down there. So for the code, what we first need to do is identify the current segment number. And we can do that by simply sampling it, right? So let's type first a comment. Let's say um, identify current and previous IDs. Now, something I like to do in VEX is to actually add some tabs if I add comments, because that makes it easier to read personally for me. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to type local variable integer current segment equals the integer attribute segment. So if you recall, down here we have a segment attribute. I'm going to sample that. And then next, I want to sample the segment attribute of the previous point number. Now, in this case, that would mean that if we're looking at point one, I want to sample the segment attribute value of point zero. Okay, so in that case, let's copy this, paste it in. And I'm going to say previous segment or prev. Then as for the attribute, I'm going to use a point vex expression to sample the point attribute for the previous point. Let's say um, point zero, because we're using input zero here to sample from just the same data set. But because vex runs in parallel, um, each individual point cannot sample what another point has retrieved. Okay, so if point 1 evaluates its segment number, it cannot evaluate what point 2 evaluated in its loop. Okay, uh, so instead we need to actually sample what comes into the node using this input here. We can specify that as 0. Then I'm going to sample the segment um, attribute value. So let's specify that. And then we need to specify the point number we want to grab. Now, the reason I sorted them by their segment ID is so the numbers, their point numbers, should also line up as much as possible. Let's say point one is going to sample its own point number minus one. 
Now that should mean that now our previous segment is going to be 0, 0.0 if we are running over 0 0.1. If you want to see this data, you can always output it. So let's say y at um, segment test equals previous segment. And now down here, you'll see segment test. Also, if we visualize this, and we might have to actually go in here, set this up as a marker, and let's make this a little bit brighter. So maybe orange could work. And now each number will tell us what number was the previous segment ID. So in this case, like I said, point one retrieves segment ID from zero, point two retrieves segment ID from one, and so forth. However, point zero doesn't have a negative one to sample, so it's gonna retrieve zero as well. We'll fix this one separately, okay? We'll do this in a minute. So I'm gonna leave this code in here, but I'm gonna write the next section. So next, let's deal with the connection first, and then we'll deal with this last point, this problem here that I mentioned. So to do this, let's add a new comment. Let's call this one, um, connect current and previous segment with a polyline. So something like that. Then let's create an if statement. We're gonna say if the previous segment, so that's the segment number of the previous segment, is equal to the current segment minus one. And we're doing this just to make sure that, let's say we have point one, its previous segment is zero. So if its current segment is one, minus one is zero. So if that's true, we will create a connection. However, if we have point zero, it's trying to look for negative one, which doesn't exist. So it cannot sample the segment ID from point negative one, right? So it returns zero. In that case, the previous segment is zero, but the current segment is zero minus one. So zero is not equal to minus one. Therefore, we don't make a connection. So this is just a fail safe. Just keep it clean. We only try to make a connection when it's valid. Now, in order to make a connection, uh, we can actually add a new primitive in here. And we can do that with the add prim vex expression. Let's say add prim. And add prim basically needs a couple of variables. First, it needs the geometry to add a primitive to, which is going to be zero. Then we need to specify what type of geometry it should be. In this case, we want to create a polyline. We don't want to create a polygon. We just want to create a line. And then we need to specify each point number we want to connect. So let's do that. Let's say zero, then inside quotation marks, polyline. Then the next variable is gonna be the current point number. And then after that, we're gonna say the point number of our previous point, so point number minus one. If we do that, then now it's gonna start drawing polylines between all of our points. So that's pretty neat. However, like I mentioned, um, these points are still neighbors. So technically they're still part of the same balcony. We still need to connect these two together because these balconies are technically still neighbors. So we need to make sure they belong to the same primitive line. Now at the moment, this one is trying to retrieve um, segment number 50, which is down here. So just remember, these orange numbers represent the previous segment number, right? So the yellow numbers here are the actual segment numbers, and these ones retrieve which one it's trying to grab. What we need to do is we need to write some code that identifies if the last point is also the neighbor of point zero. If that's true, then we continue. Otherwise, we don't connect. So to do that, 
first we need to identify what the maximum amount of segments is that we have, which in this case is 51, right? Starting at zero, going to 51. And we can do that fairly easily. Uh, we can simply sample how many tiles we have on our building in one row. So we can look here at um, isolate walls. We're already doing this in our system quite a few times, as you can see. So we can do that again. And then next, we also need to sample how many actual segments we have in here, which in this case is, um, well, 34, because it starts at zero. And then if we count up around the building, we have 33. So that means we have 34 segments. Let's set this up over here. Let's type um, get maximum segment count and remaining segment count. So this part here is simply going to be a couple of parameters that we can put some H script in. Let's say um, integer variable maximum segments is a um, channel integer parameter max segments and then let's copy that and let's say maximum floor segments so the maximum amount of segments that are remaining on this floor then let's go ahead and expose those and then we need to plug that up so we already know we need to grab the um, count up here from this isolate walls node let's grab that and then in here we can say number of primitives isolate walls which will return the amount of primitives we have on this node if we type this up properly but of course because this is retrieving the amount of primitives to get the actual primitive number we need to subtract this by one so let's do that. So there we go. Segment 51 is the last one. We know we have a maximum amount of segments of 51 in this case. Then next we need to grab the floor segment count. So for that down here, we can just grab how many points are present in this mesh. So let's just grab that. Let's say n points, zero minus one that's just simply going to retrieve the amount of points coming in and then give us the last number so in that case that is point number 33 so now we have that information we can now process it so what i want to do at this point is basically retrieve the segment id so the yellow number from our last point on this floor for all the current balcony elements which is point 33. So point 33 has, in this case, 51. Let's sample that. Let's say, let's grab our previous segment code, put that down here, and then I'm gonna say last floor segment equals our segment, but instead of sampling it from the point number, Let's sample it from our floor, maximum floor segments. So we already know that's point number 33. Let's grab that. Plug it in there. Now let's test this out. So let's say we update our segment test. Instead, let's grab last floor segment right there. If we do that, all of these are going to return 51 right because that's the last segment and now what we have to do is actually pretty simple we can copy this code here put it down below and I'm gonna first check if the current segment is number zero if that's the case then we want to connect to the previous point which is gonna be number 33 so that is our maximum floor segments right there so we can just grab that there we go. Now we have a connection. Now at this point, this will already work to some extent. 
let's say I grab the end of my network. Um, if you change values on your interface and you don't have the end of the for each loop cooked, then it doesn't matter. It won't update anything. You need to have the end of your for each loop or something behind it cooking. So you see the output of your for each loop in the end. Let me go ahead and change my balcony width here. If I do that and I lower it low enough, then at this point we have three sections of balconies. But because our first point is located on point zero, this one now tries to connect to that point here, because that is the last point number, point 20. Unfortunately, that's not what I want, because in fact, it doesn't sit next to it. It's not actually a neighbor, right? And what I would like to do to fix that is to verify if the point we're trying to connect to is also the last segment number. So in this case, the maximum segment number 51, not 50, because right now it's trying to connect the number 50, which is wrong. Let's go over here and let's add an end um, operator. And then we can say if the last floor segment is equal to the maximum segments, then we allow a connection. So if this number, the last floor segment, is identical to the last um, number, then we allow it to connect. Otherwise, we don't. Now, if I move this back, change my balcony width again, you can see we make a connection if it's wide enough, but if it's not, then we don't connect. So it's a little complicated, but pretty useful. So let's um, finish up this code here. First, I'm just going to add a comment. We're going to say if segment zero and uh, the last remaining segment is also the maximum segment. Connect both with a polyline. And then in this case, I don't need this test attribute anymore. So I'm just going to comment that out. So now that we have that, this is working. We now have proper connections between our points if they are part of the same balcony. So let's uh, finish up this loop. Next, let's make sure that all of these primitives are combined into a single polyline. And we can do that very quickly using a polypath. So let's grab a polypath sop, which is a node that allows us to take multiple curves in this case. And unless there's an intersection between those curves, it's going to combine them into a single primitive. So if I hide my numbers for a second, here you can see we now have individual segments. So it became from that to this. And then finally, I'm going to run this through another sort node to make sure that all the point numbers are sorted along the vertex order of these um, polylines, because as they are created, they have a vertex order. If we create a sort node, plug that in, and then we're going to sort our points by the vertex order. So now they have a proper orientation, right? A proper direction and uh, numbering. That's important, um, but we'll deal with that in a minute when we actually use our group node. So now we have this, we can apply it to all of our floors. And there we go. We now have lines that represent each of our balconies and if they are connected or not. All right, then next, let's set up so that we can actually remove the points if they are on a corner or not and we can set it up with a switch so we can toggle it on or off. Let's grab a blast node right here. And I'm going to call this one the remove corners blast node. And in this case, what we need to do is specify the corner attribute on our geometry. Now we do actually have a corner group 
but it is not a point group, so I can't isolate out my points with it. It's actually a um, primitive group right here, and we can't use that because it doesn't contain any data. So instead of addressing a group here, let's instead address an attribute. Let's say at corner equals one. And then let's make sure it's addressing a point attribute. So it looks at points. And if that's the case, then now, if one of our corner attributes is one, it's going to remove it. If it's zero, it won't. So now that we have that, it will basically remove any potential location where a door can spawn on one of our balcony curves here, um, if it's in a corner. And if it wraps around a corner while doing so, which we don't really have in this case, so let me grab my settings and change this around a bit. Let's say I make these balconies a lot bigger, so they potentially do wrap around some corners, like here for example. You can see how, in this case, we are removing the points in the corner. It will keep the line intact, um, so we still identify this as one balcony, but because the points are removed, it no longer contains those points in that line. So we don't have to worry about it. We can actually identify each balcony by their primitive number and safely remove the points that we don't want, where we don't want doors to spawn. So let's create a switch so we can turn this on and off, and then let's move on. Let's um, add a switch right here. And I'm going to call this one Allow Corner Doors. All right. Now this one is going to be coming from a parameter on our interface, which we don't have yet. So I would like to create that. Let's open up our type properties again. And in this case, I would like to add it on our building settings over here, in our main settings, right below allow upper windows in corners. I'm gonna add a setting here called allow upper doors in corners as well. So let's open this up. And over here, let's copy this setting, paste it back in, and let's rename it. So let's call this one, allow upper doors in corners. And by default, I'm gonna set this to off. So if you have that, you can accept that. And then let's just grab it. And let's plug it into the switch. All right, so now we can turn this on and off if we want to. So in this case, we do allow doors in corners and otherwise we don't. All right, cool. Now next, let's set it up so we can actually specify where on each of these balcony lines for potential door locations, we actually want our doors to spawn. And for that, we are going to use a group by range node once again. Now we do want to uh, hook this one up still, because this is still just a copy of our uh, balcony groups by range node up here. So let's rewrite this one a bit. Uh, but before we do that, let's create a for each loop by connectivity. Because we want to sample each of these points based on their connectivity, or rather based on the primitive that they're actually in. Let's create a for each loop by connected piece. And this might place it down there. So let's reposition it up. Now I'm going to grab my line, plug it up here. And in this case, this one is going to run over primitives by default. I'm going to run it over points instead. So let's switch it over to points. And we also need to make sure we update this connectivity node as well, because right now it's creating a class attribute on our primitives. Since every one of our primitives is unique, we don't need to have it on our primitives. Instead, I want it on my points as well. So now, under points, we now have a class attribute. So every one of our points has a unique ID. Let's show that one. Let's say class. And it will display it as a color, for starters, but 
I want to see it as a value. So let's change it over to marker once again. So there you go. We now have 0, 3, 10, 7, etc. So each one has a unique number. And if we then run this over this for each loop, we can now look at each one independently, which is what I want, right? So let's look at this first one right there. Right now, this one has points 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so we can start numbering at 0 using a group by range node. Let's make a copy of this for now, and let's plug it inside of this loop. Also, let's actually give this loop a name. So let's say we call this one for each connected balcony end. And we can just copy this over to the begin node as well. So we know what this one runs over at a glance. Okay. Then inside of this node, let's rename this one to balcony door group. And instead of by range, I'm going to say relative start to end. So this node is already set up mostly correct. Let's grab our parameters again and let's change over our settings. So we do have our door interval and offset right here. So first let's change over our group. So we create the correct group name. Let's call this one balcony door. Just like over here on the left. Then down below, I do want to run over the entire range of points that we have at any point in this loop. So I'm just going to set each one of these to zero. So starts at zero and ends at zero. And that's because we are running from relative start to end. So if this is zero and that is zero, it will simply run over every single point. And then down here, let's update these. So the first number, the select number, is basically going to determine how many points out of a certain amount we are going to select. Now, like I mentioned, I only want one door per selection. So if we have a selection of five points, I only want one door per five points, which is what the um, balcony door interval is for. So I'm going to set this one to one. And we can also remove the expression field as well by deleting the channel. Then over here on the right, let's change this one to balcony door interval. We can just plug it in like that and this one to offset. Now at this point, this will work. If I go and change my door interval, let's lower it. You see how now we have either, well, a door everywhere, every two points, every three points, and so forth. And once it gets out of range, well, we only have one door. This should work most of the time. If I change the offset, it will start cycling. So let's say I set it to two, see how it jumps. So this looks good, but let's see what happens if we try to apply this to more points. So these are the actual original point numbers, zero, one, two, and three. But let's see what happens if we apply it to the entire set. So over here we have say, um, points four, five, six, and seven. Let's find this one. That's pass one in this case. Let's change our offset a bit and then change our interval. If we move this too far, we won't have any selection anymore. And that's because our group by range node now has a selection that ranges from one to six, but the offset is four. So it actually moves the entire range out of range. In this case, it doesn't work anymore. In order to fix that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop this back over itself or offset if it goes past the amount of points that we have in this set. Basically, we're just going to use a modulo expression. And if we have more offset than the points that we have here, we just start back at zero. Let's hook this up. Let's type in modulo endpoints zero. If that's the case, then if we move our offset too far, it just starts back at zero. And we will never have that issue where our range sits in between our point set and then we have no doors at all. 
might be a little complicated, but this basically just ensures that we never get out of range because it will always snap back to zero. Let's now view all of our points and make sure that it works on every one of them. Let's just set it really high. We can now cycle and no matter what these values are, they can be large, they can be small, we'll always try to spawn valid doors on our balconies. So with that, let's return this back to the default values. Let's say control middle mouse click on the parameters, which will reset them. And then let's hook it up. So for this, I'm going to use a group transfer node. Let's just plug that in. We can get rid of this group node here. And in this case, I'm going to call this one balcony doors transfer or door transfer in this case. So let's set up our group first. Over here, I'm going to select the balcony door group. Then I'm going to say in case of a group name conflict. So basically, if the group already exists on the input, I want to override it. And we need to do that because we already have the dummy group up here. So if the group already exists, we need to ensure we override it. Otherwise, it will fail. Then let's change our distance threshold, because as you can see, we are currently applying this group all over the building. This is a sparse data set, whereas this is a full data set. So this needs to be transferred at a very small distance to avoid it from bleeding over. Let's set it to 0 0.001. These points overlap their originals, so that should work just fine. So if that's set up, now this should work. Let's test it out. I'm going to change my group filter up here to only show balcon. And now we should be able to see where our balcony doors are going to go. So if I go and change the offset, we can see how we do have one door. If I change my interval to something lower, now there's more doors all over the building. So this is working properly now. So at this point, um, let's go ahead and hook this up inside of our tile loop. And then I'm going to call it a video because this video has gone on for long enough. We still have more to do. However, we'll split this into the next one. So for now, Let's quickly hook this up in here. Let's create a switch. Let's plug it in above our merge balconies node. Because what I would like to do is have a switch that either grabs a door piece or a window piece, depending on, on the upper balconies, if it needs a door or a window. Now at the moment, we don't actually have an upper floor door. This is a ground floor door. So we'll need to create a variation for that. Let's first set up a switch so we can grab the door or the window. Let's grab from up here a connection and plug it in there. And I'm going to call this switch the balcony door switch. Now we are already outputting an attribute over here called balcony door for every point that has a balcony door group, right? Let's grab this attribute from our null node. So over here, let's add a spare input, grab our data node, plug it in, and then let's just say um, point minus one, zero for point zero, then balcony door, and then zero. If we do that, then now we should be grabbing if it's a balcony door or not. If we now view it on the outside, it should be showing us a door. Now, like I mentioned, at the moment, this is not the correct door. We need to have a separate door for the upper floors. So let's grab this network up here for our door ground floor. And let's make a duplicate of that. And then I'm going to drag it over to the left. We're going to name this one um, doors for the upper floors.
And in order to control which one of these we're going to grab, we can use a switch that retrieves the um, bottom floors attribute. So if we are on the bottom floors, which doesn't have balconies, we use the standard door. And otherwise, we use the upper floor door. So let's plug this in like that. So if we are on the bottom floors, it's a value of 1. So let's first plug in the upper floors, because that will be 0. And then let's plug in the ground floors, the bottom floors, as value 1. Let's name this switch the bottom floors switch. And then for this switch, we just need to set up our link again. So let's add a spare input, reference our tile data. And then the attribute that we want to reference is the bottom floors attribute. So let's just grab that. This should be, again, point, negative one for the node, zero for the point number, bottom floors for the attribute name, and then zero for the index of the attribute. Let's plug that in like that. And now it should be grabbing this door right there. Now we just need to set up the texture. The inside is already correct, so we don't need to worry about that. We just need to deal with the outside. Um, let's quickly have a look. This should be the bottom UVs in this case, which has the concrete panels too at the moment. Let's look for the upper floor windows. So let's set up the tiling red brick material in our doors, upper floors. Let's go over here, red brick. And let's make sure we also apply that for the unreal material as well, of course. And if you have that set up, then this should now be correct. So now we have a switch for the bottom floors and the upper floors. So we have two types of doors, right? And next to that, we have the ability to spawn either a door or a window, depending on if there's a door or not. Now, we still need to set up some other code for the corners as well, um, but we'll do that in the next video. So if you've been following along so far, then now you should have a basic building with doors and basic proto balconies. We'll eventually take these and turn them into the final balconies. But for now, let's call it here. Let's quickly test this out. Let's say we make our balconies a little bit wider. Let's make them eight wide. And if we have an interval of five, then now each balcony should have two doors like this. We can also offset them, of course. However, at this point, because of our offset changes, the door now actually falls on a corner right there. And then it won't spawn because we disabled that with this switch. Let's go to our base settings and let's enable doors on corners. And if we do that, then now it will allow it to spawn a door there. So that's all working just fine. Okay, so with that, I think we're done with this video. Um, let's make sure we save our asset and we also save our scene. And then in the next video, we are going to continue working on this and finish up our balconies so they will look a bit more like that. So thank you for watching this video, and I hope to see you in the next one. Have a good one.